If you're buying a wine at around five quid, you're not actually buying a wine. So I'm pretty ill qualified to do anything else. And then as in all good family businesses, someone somewhere messed it all up. You've got to be really brave to send a wine back. And I reckon nine and three quarters people out of 10 will not send a wine back. Everyone left the table and the whole of the evening was about four ladies and lots of other people chasing Tommy Banks around the, the kitchen island while he was trying to do the cooking. Anything over 15 quid, you're paying for a marketing machine. On Trustpilot, you've got nearly 300 five-star reviews. How did that happen? Welcome to the Lunch at Work podcast, where we talk to experts about how to make workplaces better. Tom, thanks very much for coming to our uh, Lunch at Work podcast. Uh, so Tom Gilby here from Tom Gilby Limited. Uh, great to have you along and uh, sort of have a bit of an education and understanding about wine. Uh, and also everything else about you, but you didn't get into the wine trade uh, by chance. There's a history of the, the family behind that. So I'm pretty ill qualified to do anything else. Yeah. So my family were the first English family to buy a chateau in Bordeaux in 1865. And uh, before that, basically, long story short, my great 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 grandparents came back from the Crimean War, had nothing else to do other than set up a six foot trestle table on Oxford Street and flog South African Chablis, Pinot Noir, Sherry, everything that's now illegal, as in illegally labelled, but legal to drink, which went on to them having a, a, a chateau in Bordeaux when uh, the duty laws changed and becoming you know, the largest seller of, uh, of spirits and wine in the UK at one time. So at one time, Gilby's were selling one in three bottles of wine consumed in the UK, but they got famous for Mother's Ruin, for gin. And, uh, and that was all bottled and distilled in what is now the Cannon Roundhouse. So everything, oh. all the wine was shipped over into the Cannon Roundhouse, massive warehouses there that were then bottled. And before trains, it was horse and car all over the country. And then it was trains. And then as in all good family businesses, someone somewhere messed it all up joined with a company called uh, Watney's to form independent distillers and vintners that is now Diageo. Wow. That is a little spotted history of one of the largest wine, well, alcohol suppliers yeah. in the world. Yeah. And it's fantastic for me because when I travel with wine, yeah. there are still some people who are just about still alive who remember either working for Gilby's or having done things with Gilby's and so there's a great connection there that's really helped me in my business and so the family element to what yeah. we have in BM so as a business we're very uh, we you know we have our uh, BM family slogan we want to be connected to each other as individuals we support and guide each other you've taken that similarity with what you've created now and we've worked together previously in lots of uh, different events yeah. and so on um, do you feel that our brand values and and what you bring to the party is something that relates to that and how is that benefiting the clients? Uh, yes. And I'm not just saying this because there's a microphone in front of me, a camera here, but we did, you know, we did an event um, two weeks ago. Yeah. Two weeks kitchen WA. And it's the first event that you steered me on this of, of running a wine tasting that incorporated the values of beer. So we worked together to get your values, which funnily enough, it, it, if I was organized and had values, they'd be exactly my values too. And, um, and I'm in a really fortunate space now, I think, in that I, I I generally work with people I like and the synergy that I feel genuinely that we have with, with your team at BM, I absolutely love. And and I can see it in your clients. They they feel really valued. And life is just too short not to deal with people who value who value you and value what you do. One of the things that we've noticed is that sort of uh, as the pandemic has ended, people are back into the workplace. You've done a lot of online uh, wine tastings. Yeah. You've done a lot of in-house wine tastings. Where has been sort of the greatest value to you? Where's been the benefit? And actually you've seen people coming back into the workplace that is mm -hmm. much more centered around these type of events that are bringing people together. Yeah. Well, if I was a really good businessman, I would say just do online. Far more profitable for us. Far less washing up, much easier, no venues. But really going into doing the physical, when we're all together, uh, events, is one, you have to be a lot more creative. And um, 
So there's a lot more fun to be had of finding good venues, finding different wines, different concepts. So I really think for a customer employing myself and my team to run an event, I would definitely say um, do it all together. I, I don't know about how you feel, but the thought of a... I, I used to love Zoom meetings. I now really don't like them unless I really don't want to see the person that I'm having a meeting with. And... Um, and and I think there is nothing that that actually builds business than relationships that are built over uh, over a relaxed and fun and engaging atmosphere. Have you seen that benefit within the companies of different departments, different people coming together, and therefore, yeah, creating new relationships with the work? Totally, I do. And I think it's it, it, it you know, where I used to do this with um, the on trade with restaurants, they tend to have a really high staff turnover waiters leave uh, uh, bartenders leave so we can do all this sort of training and engaging things that help them learn but it's really soul destroying because you do it every other month you've got a new team yeah. whereas if we do it for your team about which i had an email yesterday by the way is um it's the same it, you you keep your people and which makes it much more valuable to i can then go in and run an event with them for you or who, one of your team building on things that we did last time. So some of our listeners are going to want to know about wine. One of the sort of misconceptions, I guess, about wine is when you're in a restaurant, you order a bottle yeah. of wine, the waiter comes over and he uh, or she yeah. uh, asks you to try it. Why? Yeah, you've got to be really brave. You've got to be really brave to send a wine back. And I reckon nine and three quarters people out of 10 will not send a wine back. Yeah. And actually seven out of 10 bottles of wine sealed with a cork is to some degree tainted by cork. Yeah. So by the law of averages, you're going to get. So if a familiar is offering you this, shouldn't they tell you? Yes. And generally, if you go to a good restaurant with, they a, familiar. Will, with a familiar, who's good, yeah. they would have tried the wine. The difficulty is if they've tried the wine and you know lots about wine, yeah. it is actually still faulty. Then you have a discussion with a sommelier who actually thinks that the wine's not okay. bought you. So for all our listeners, it's very clear. It's not about whether you like it or not. It's all to do with whether the wine has been oxidized. Yeah, but if you are a really good restaurant or a really good sommelier, it is also about, depending on where the price point is, whether you like it or not. Okay. Because it, you know, you're running a restaurant. I come to your restaurant and order a bottle of 40 quid wine and I don't like it. Yeah. You might think I might come back again if you if you're nice to me. So, so lots of events you've done online and so on. What's been the one that stood out as being the funniest uh, for whatever reason, calamitous or? We were working for a business and we had to put in a prize um, for a, of a wine event for one of the partners to win the wine. And all of the partners were paying a certain amount into a kitty that was all going to charity, and there was a healthy budget to run this wine event so i had to get a chef so i got a chef um up in uh, yorkshire called tommy banks who runs um the black swan who many people will have seen on master chef and he can cook and um so I, I i put in dinner with tommy and myself doing the wines and the food and this lovely lady won it in the raffle and decided that we'd go up to scotland to one of the beautiful golf courses up in uh, Edinburgh hang right and uh, and there was a beautiful uh, beautiful chalet there owned by the owners so I met Tommy up in um, uh, up in Edinburgh we had lunch all good he bought six of his chefs I needed some help so I bought my daughter India who was sort of thinking she might get into cooking I said you're going to come and pour some wine anyway there was 12 people the budget they had was fantastic we got amazing wine i organized this just fantastic the table looked beautiful everything was absolutely fantastic and then literally within sort of wine number two everyone left the table and the whole of the evening was lit was about four ladies and uh, lots of other people chasing tommy banks around the, the kitchen island while he was trying to do the cooking but it was a fantastic evening really amazing very very relaxed really fun event how do you keep people engaged without them just sort of necking the wine, etc.? How do you get them to sort of really stay focused on you without using a whistle? Um, I think 
it's part of what I the bit that I really really enjoy. I love wine, but to be quite honest, the show is about the entertainment. show, and and wine is is what makes it the wheels turn around. And I think that's for me. That's a I find that a really interesting question because many many wine events that I go to are pretty pretty explanatory. Uh, they, you know, we're learning about things, and. I think to keep people engaged in the room, well, my secret, it's not much of a secret, is engage any, everybody in the room. So I think I'm okay at working out who's got a big gob anyway and is going to need some, some air time. Or management. Or management. And I'm also fairly good at working out who's a bit quiet and might not want to be put on stage and who might want a little bit of juggling along. So there's a fine balance to draw, but if you have, I, I quite like to get people working in teams so they don't feel alone and isolated and silly. Um, we're all much happier to feel silly all together rather than on our own. So we get people in teams and then and try and and pull all the characters in. For that reason, so for a, that reason, it really limits, I think, how. Um, how one of my the size of of one of my events i reckon you know for for me to control a room mm. in a way that not i'll enjoy but they'll enjoy is 100 120 people max and the great thing about your events is that actually becomes quite competitive oh yeah oh yeah and then and people will try and sneak a look at the labels and definitely they? Oof. who would do that i can't remember and i think also also angus my events are generally in the evenings generally on wednesday and thursday night People work very hard. They've not had much to eat. The very last thing they want to do is be taught about why. And if they do, they should go to Berry Brothers because they're much better at it than me. But we run a really... This is a show. This is a show. And it's a fun... Uh, with a really good food, really good wine, and really good fun. Why is it important to the uh, the businesses, the clients that you're that are asking for you? Why Tom Gilby? Why come in and do these events? Well, they're, they're, they're for engagement with the people that you want to engage with so i've just redone our website and cobbled together a few quotes that we had one of which was from the senior partner a accountancy firm who said the events that we've done with us have bought them more business than any other activity they've done in the last 18 months so one reason is to network and get to know clients facilitators partners better and do more business. The other thing, the other reason, or the other opportunity, I think, which we have not exploited enough yet, is exactly what you and I do together, which is team engagement. So you will know better than anyone how difficult it is to keep teams loyal, engaged, and part of the BM family. Therefore, I think a big market for us is to HR directors, HR, you know, people wanting to keep teams because, yes, we need customers, but we also need our, uh, uh, people in our business. And so when we're doing these events and you're reaching out to people and so on, and alcohol and wine is what we're talking about. Yeah. However, there's a, a responsibility. There's a portion that are non-alcoholic yeah. and don't want to drink. Yeah. How do we get them to still be a part of this, to feel included and inclusive to what's being, you know, what the objective is? We're seeing at our events at least 10% of people choosing not to drink. Um, and we're consciously offering now, although it's been very difficult because finding non-alcoholic wine is difficult, we are consciously offering non-alcoholic alternatives. So I think I finally found yesterday a really good sparkling wine called Naughty. Listen, callers, listeners. Um, a really good sparkling wine so i think now if we which we will do yeah. offer guests on arrival a glass of fizz would you like an alcoholic one or a non-alcoholic one i reckon if it's presented as simply as that yeah. we'd have 30 40 percent taken non-alcoholic either because they don't want to drink at all or because they don't want to drink as much as much yeah. really the way we run the show because you're in teams and you're it it, it really doesn't matter and people don't feel left out if uh, if they don't drink we find a job for them to do. A moment ago, you talked about sustainability. When you did one of your tastings, it was linked to an event that you did and yeah. so on. 
what's the future for this in wine? We've seen corks move to, uh, you know, into screw yeah. caps and so on. Where is this going in terms of making sure and you know wine is being imported? Yeah, big vats and bottles here and so. On. What is the future for wine uh, in Europe? I find this really interesting, and I'm, you will see the same in your in in your business and in every business. There are businesses that take it seriously, and there are businesses who just plant a tree. And it's very easy to get a feel for which wineries and winemakers are actually taking things seriously, and they're doing way more than just planting a tree. Two things, really, with the world getting warmer, us getting warmer, we're going to see more English wines coming onto our menus. And really, there is absolutely no reason for us to be serving uh, non-vintage champagne because in this country, we can do it just as well for um, the same money. People are saying that English wine is good, is good, if not better in some cases. Yeah, it's it, exactly. It's really good, and there's a good. You know, that's the reason why Tatisier bought land here, yeah. um, Pomeroy bought land here. It's it's really happening. So for sparkling wine, where you need really good acidity, we're good at that, um, and we're quite good at white wine. And we are not yet really good at rosé or red, but it's coming. So we'll, we will buy more locally. We will buy yeah. a lot more English wine in the future. It's yeah. getting better. Yeah, we're there now on sparkly. Yes, and so therefore the importing. At, what's that going to do to the to the wine trade from where traditionally we've bought stuff, and then you have the new world coming in from Argentina and Malbec and New Zealand and Sauvignon Blancs, etc. What's going to happen to those? Well, I think as we all get, you know, you run your business and you have some control of 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 what your business is buying. I think you'll see your business championing English sparkling wine when English white wine gets to be and it is really good when it gets to be sensibly priced I, can't, I really can't see why you would be able to justify New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc at a similar kind of price when really we're doing something quite good here the other thing that you'll see with uh, wine trends which isn't about the sustainability issue but alcohol levels so the warmer the warmer the climate, generally the higher the alcohol. And consumers are really getting more aware of of do they want to be drinking a fourteen and a half percent Malbec? You know, it, it doesn't make you the brightest button on the field the next day. And we and so if we're importing wines from cooler climates, i.e. closer to us, yeah. or making wines in our garden, they're generally lower alcohol, fresher, and being made better and better. When you are in a supermarket, yeah, uh, you often see people looking at the yeah uh, um, the shelves and they're picking up wine. They don't know what they're looking for. How do they? And people go on price often. Yeah, what can people do in the supermarket? What's your top tip? Okay, so think about how much wine is actually in the bottle. So that I could be wrong here, but I think duty is two pounds sixty four a bottle. So that's before you've had any wine, bottle, cork, or anything. That goes to the chancellor. And then um, you've got VAT. So you're above three quid already without any wine. And then you've got some margin that Tesco's might be making. Not much. So really, if you're buying a wine at around five quid, you're not actually buying a wine. Anything above five quid is into wine territory. So I would say drink less. Pay more. Pay more. And and you'll get into sweet spot at around mm, eight to twelve quid. Okay. Really, really, and and I and generally, I'm going to get shot for this, but generally at eight quid, if it's coming from warmer climates, particularly the New World, you're generally drinking alcoholic fruit juice, and if you like that kind of stuff, fantastic. If you want wine with a little bit more character, and you're spending eight, ten, twelve quid, shop in Europe. If you like New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, go Grüner Veltliner in Austria. We've written a blog on it. You've written a blog on it. I have. So um, ad be adventurous. And I think generally supermarkets will be selling wines that the mainstream palette, which I've got, would be enjoying at 10 to 12 quid. You can experiment there and, and get a good wine. We're coming into summer. Yes. Okay. And rosé used to be like, go back to your price point, super cheap. Yeah. And it used to be as pale as you like. And yeah. It was great fun for drinking and so on. Then Whispering Angel came along and pushed the price up to 20 or quid a bottle. Yeah. 
tell me now, what's the what's the right thing to do for buying a rosé this summer? Okay, so I did a tasting yesterday, a video that's on with three different roses. One was an English rosé made down in the North Downs in Kent by a grower called Charles and Ruth Simpson, excellent winemakers, 11 quid. The other was uh, Whispering Angel at circa 20 quid. And the other was Domaine Ott, which is a Bandol rosé at 40 quid. So it's where do you get the value? And to be quite honest, the English rosé, totally delicious. I'd drink it all day with a picnic lunch. Fine. And then the other two roses are a little bit, they're a little richer, the acidity is slightly lower, a bit more stone fruit. And they're perfectly good. And the Domain Ot is, is perfectly delicious, but it jolly well should be perfectly delicious at 40 quid. So cut to the chase. Anything over 15 quid, you're paying for a marketing machine. What's next for Tom? What's, uh, what's the next stage in, in growing Tom Gilby Limited? I would like to, and I'm currently finding and training people who I think are really engaging, charismatic, fun, to some degree humble hosts who can control a room. Because it's all about, uh, we can supply the wine, but we could give you a really pants event with great wine. It's all about the team that are running the show. So my future is to find other presenters, not too many, um, that we can then make sure that we run two events, three events. I can see why you want to stay in the event side of the business, because on Trustpilot, you've got nearly 300 five-star reviews. How did that happen? I, we have, which is fantastic. We've also got one, and I think only one, four-star review. Uh -huh. so I'm much more interested in how did that. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, that's impressive. No? But it's great. Yeah. Uh, it's it's great. I think, really, when um, when we get in front of people, they have a fun time. And what I really want them to do and how our business grows is communicate in some way that they've had a fun time. So I do mention it, you know, and that we have a trust pilot site. If you'd be so kind, scribble a review, they could scribble anything they want. Yeah. To be honest, it's mu that's more important to me than getting orders. We don't clatter the order book. Uh, it's, it's all about reputation. And um, so when you asked me earlier about what the future of the business is, I only want to grow the, the business in a way that gets us more of those trust partner reviews because then on the, then it will be good. And as we end, uh, where would Tom recommend a uh, summer destination of choice for great wine and great food? What restaurant would you recommend? Okay, so here I'm going to pick two. If it's summer, yeah, I could pick two restaurants. Okay. One of which we've had lunch at. I'm paying, no, no. and one of which you're paying. And they're both very close to each other. Okay, so one is run by a very good friend of mine and uh, and has become a friend of yours called Sam Harrison, who runs a fantastic restaurant up uh, by Hammersmith Bridge called Sam's Riverside. Every, it's brilliant. It, it's fantastic. Yeah, but it's really good. So I'm paying for that, yeah? Okay. Then you're paying yeah. for the ultimate overpriced, fabulousness that you could possibly have just down the road at the river cafe okay because i just think if you're going to shoot me in the morning and say where are you going to have uh, dinner tonight yeah. on a summer's evening it's the river cafe okay thank you tom for today i really appreciate you coming in and uh chatting about everything to do with wine and uh, look forward to supporting you in your events as you uh continue throughout the summer angus thank you very very much i've loved it this podcast is powered by bm caterers Contacting BM is the easiest way to start your journey to a better workplace experience. Click the link in the description for more info.